Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for the invitation. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to hear what I've been up to for the last, well, I guess, four and a half years now during my PhD. Um, so as Ben had already highlighted, we were kind of joking before the stream started that now that two of my friends and subsequently one of my bosses has presented for the Open Science Talks, the pressure was kind of on to follow suit. So uh, today I'm gonna be talking more on the side of phosphorus chemistry and how we can actually use mechanochemical methods to clean up some of the sustainability issues that phosphorus can tend to have in this day and age. And I'm gonna try and highlight as best I can in the next 35, 40 minutes or so, um, how we've been able to do this for a wide range of materials uh, at a bunch of different length scales. But first and foremost, the most important part of my talk is acknowledging the people that have really helped me get to where I am today and have helped me figure out a lot of these problems that I'm gonna highlight uh, later on in my slides. So I have the great luxury of actually being co-supervised. So first by Professor Audrey Moores, um, who specializes in nanoparticle design, nanocatalysis, photocatalysis, and biomass. And of course, Thomas Lev, who we heard from a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so I've had the great pleasure of learning from a wide range of people with lots of different specialities. Um, and specifically, I've had the pleasure of working with two really good undergraduate students, uh, Lucius Hatherley, who helped me a lot on the first project, um, and Georgia Douglas, who is subsequently helping me on project two, which is the one I'll highlight tonight, and also uh, the later project of my PhD, which I won't be able to get into just for the sake of time today. Um, and of course, always my lab mates, both past and present, um, for constantly making me better and helping me to dig through these issues as well. Um, so I'm coming to McGill from the University of Guelph in Ontario. So uh, definitely still a Canadian native. Um, and my specialty was coming into this from a nanoscience, a pure nanoscience background. So looking at things much more from the physics and mathematics of it. Um, but toward the end of my undergraduate degree, I got really interested in inorganic synthetic chemistry and material science. And so that's ultimately how um, I ended up getting connected to McGill and doing what I'm doing now. But why phosphorus chemistry specifically? Why should we even care? Uh, well, phosphorus has its, its fingers, if you will, its influence in so many different layers um, of who we are as a humanity. So whether that's um, existing in our DNA as part of the major backbone or as being a major component in the fertilizers that we use to feed ourselves. Um, even so far as um, things like, and this is something that a lot of us more classically trained chemists are probably used to, um, things like designing ligands for catalysts that we ultimately need to make materials to survive as well as pharmaceuticals to deal with a lot of the medicinal challenges that we face. So phosphorus really is quintessential to human survival. But it also has its major drawbacks. And a couple of the pictures that are highlighting it here at the end, so I, J, and K specifically, highlight some of the downsides of phosphorus that we've begun to run into. So whether that's um, algal blooms in water sources, whether that's mining runoff, um, or overall waste contamination, um, this is something that really is only now starting to be addressed and is something that I hope mechanochemical methods can help to alleviate in some sense. And so I really like, whenever I present this topic, I really like using uh, this figure from a recent paper last year that talks about the sort of roller coaster of redox, um, as it's been referred to before, as well as some of the major issues with the current phosphorus industry as we know it. So um, phosphorus, when we mine it out of the ground, let me just get a pointer up here to make everyone. Everyone's life a little easier. So when we mine it out of the ground, it looks like this in some way, shape, or form. So it's a calcium phosphate rock. Um, it's heavily oxidized. It's in that P5 oxidation state, um, which by and large, we have a very tough time dealing with in most classical chemistries. And so the traditional way of fixing this uh, can go through sort of one of two methods, either um, a wet process where we treat with sulfuric acid, make the corresponding phosphoric acid, uh, and the Cummins group at MIT actually subsequently made the cyclic form and have shown a lot of really cool um, polyphosphorylation work with this. Um, but there are also other groups that are using phosphoric acids directly. Um, or 
conversely, we can also actually reduce the material down. So we treat it through a thermal arc process, so high temperatures, um, very energy intensive in the presence of a carbon uh, catalyst to help reduce, this, reduce the phosphorus. We get then to subsequently to P4 or white phosphorus, which um, has a tendency to self-ignite. Um, and then we take this highly reactive four-membered species and we subsequently react it with more hazardous chemicals like chlorine gas, for example. Um, so for most of us classically trained chemists, PCL3 or the um, oxidized version, the phosphoryl version of this, is something that we're traditionally used to seeing and purchasing for any of the chemistry that we may uh, end up doing. But the problem is, again, we're running through high energy processes to get from the ore to a system we can use, and then subsequently using toxic reagents to get to something uh, of a reactive handle, if you will, that we can then use for further chemistry. So there's, there's a lot of room for improvement here, ultimately. Um, and of course, other groups are also looking at recycling phosphorus from waste streams. Um, this is ultimately beyond the scope of what I want to talk about tonight, but I just wanted to highlight it and say that there are other groups that are looking at the tail end of this process as well. So it's nice to see that there are multiple um, avenues in which we can probably improve this process overall. So what is mechanochemistry? And I know for many of you that have been tuning in the last couple of weeks, this is probably going to seem a little bit redundant, but for those of you that are new, um, mechanochemistry fundamentally is just chemical reactivity we're inducing via some sort of mechanical force. So whether that's grinding, whether that's impact, um, and this can be done in a lot of very traditional or classical ways. The most easily accessible for most labs is actually going to be this traditional mortar and pestle here. Um, and this is great um, as an introduction to mechanochemistry. So if you're interested in building a mechanochemical teaching lab, for example, mortar and pestles are a cheap alternative that actually work out really well for this. Um, but they do have their own drawbacks. So they present challenges in terms of consistency of how much force we're actually applying. Plus, if you're running a reaction for half an hour, 60 minutes, um, your arm tires out pretty quickly after that. So um, we've actually developed equipment now that keeps this uh, much more consistent in terms of the amount of force that we can actually apply. So whether that's um, a vibrational mill, which Thomas Lev and Ross and Isaiah have previously talked about, and that's going to be the main workhorse for my presentation today as well. Um, or even these much larger milling systems, again, very much the same sort of role, just on a larger scale. Um, and even ones that are now removing the need for milling media, so removing the need for these milling balls we see, or even allowing us to have continuous processes, much like the, the flow type processes you're seeing uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. And overall, whichever method you end up choosing, there's some real key benefits to doing mechanochemistry, regardless of the type of chemistry you choose to do it on. Um, and by and large, the big one that we often talk about is removal of bulk solvent. So we're removing um, things from the waste stream that could potentially be hazardous. This also has a subsequent consequence where because we're working at such high relative concentrations, we can oftentimes lower the reaction temperature we run these reactions at. Um, but the one that I really want to highlight and is actually going to be key for the work that I've done in the last four and a half years is the, abil the ability to work with substrates that normally wouldn't solubilize in any traditional solvents. So we can just work with things directly as they are as powders. Um, and that actually gives us some really unique reactivity, which I hope to highlight for everyone tonight. So my two main project overviews, um, I've been rather fortunate to work on a variety of different projects and develop a bunch of different skills. So hopefully these projects are able to highlight that. But the first project I wanna talk about is actually a mixture of nanoparticle design, but also materials design and polymer chemistry, talking about synthesis of some flame retardant um, nanocrystals of cellulose, and then ultimately some synthetic polymers as well. Um, and then also, and I'll, I'll segue a little bit as to how I get there when we get there, but I'm looking at making sustainably some nickel phosphide nanoparticles to catalyze um, photo act or to help catalyze um, water splitting by light irradiation. 
So first and foremost, with the flame retardant project. So why are flame retardants so important? Why should we care about making sustainable versions? Well, I guarantee you that if you're currently sitting and watching this in some sort of chair, that the fabric that that chair is made of or the cushions that are inside that chair that you're currently sitting on probably have a flame retardant additive in them. And typically those flame retardant additives are gonna look something like this. So they're small molecules, they've got lots of halogens on them. In this case, I've highlighted some of the bromine variants. Um, and while these are great in terms of what they're designed to do, they have a lot of environmental drawbacks. So two of the key things that I wanna highlight here are the fact that because these small molecules are mixed in with our polymer of interest, that means that their connection to that material isn't as strong as if it was say covalently bound to the polymer directly. And the challenge that this gives us is actually they're then able to leach out into the landfill after you've thrown out that old office chair and replaced it with a new one, say. Um, so we wanted to step away from halogenated systems because we knew they also had a tendency to bioaccumulate, meaning that um, as they move up the food chain, they are perpetually passed along through the things that are being eaten, which ultimately can get into us. So the goals for this project ultimately were, could we step away from using halogen-based flame retardants? And regardless of the functionality that we chose, I wanted to be absolutely certain that whatever the flame retardant functionality was, we were covalently binding it to our polymer of choice, again, to reduce the amount of leaching that we were seeing. And so why not use a naturally available and actually the most abundant natural polymer that we know of, and that's cellulose. So um, I mentioned Professor Audrey Moores before. The way I actually met Audrey was initially through cellulose chemistry. So coincidentally, um, cellulose is what brought me to McGill. Um, but cellulose nanocrystals are this really fascinating material. Um, they actually are just the localized crystalline regions. So we can attain those pretty easily just by a simple acid hydrolysis of these cellulose fibers. So if you were to zoom in on what cellulose in plants look like, it has these crystalline organized regions and amorphous regions as well. And when we treat a material like that with a mineral acid, it's gonna selectively hydrolyze those amorphous regions, leaving us with these crystalline uh, nanoparticles and give us partial surface functionality as well. And so this gives you some idea. This is a TEM image I took early on in my PhD. And you can see these kind of whisker-like morphologies, right? These kind of needle uh, type materials. So they're, they're, they're beautiful in the fact that they're abundant and naturally occurring. They've got this really cool high aspect ratio, which for those of us that work in, nanop in nanoparticle design, you'll understand that making high aspect ratio particles can often be a challenge. Um, the cellulose particles are also covered in hydroxyl groups. So this gives us a lot of functionality to put on other functional groups that we want to later on. And the idea of making them in bulk from acid hydrolysis is a fairly easy process. So obtaining them in large batches is really easy to do. So I looked back through the literature and there had been a couple of examples previously of people trying to phosphorylate cellulose nanocrystals, but through traditional solution-based uh, reflux methods. And whether that was a direct phosphorylation with phosphoric acid, or combining it with phosphoric acid and a little bit of urea, which helps to both um, act as a bit of a buffer. So again, if you, if you put cellulose into highly acidic conditions, you will run the risk of actually cleaving this 1,4 beta linkage. Um, and so that urea acts as somewhat of a basic buffer to sort of tailor that down a little bit. But it also, in the case of cellulose nanocrystals, and especially in the solid state, which is something I'll highlight later on, um, the fact that these are covered in hydroxyl groups means that the crystals themselves have a tendency to stick to each other. So the urea helps to act as kind of a hydrogen bond interrupter, if you will, to give us as much available surface area as we possibly can get. But you'll probably notice that regardless of the synthesis that we're using here, we're running them at 150 degrees Celsius in water. And for those of us that have run reactions of any kind in water, you understand when I say it's really difficult to get rid of when we're done. So I really wanted to step away from this traditional methodology using some of the ideas, and I'll highlight those as we go along. 
Um, but could we do this in a way where I could phosphorylate directly by mechanochemistry? And so the system that I was actually able to develop, um, which has worked um, surprisingly pretty well, but it um, worked on a variety of substrates under a range of conditions. But ultimately, we found that if you co-milled um, phosphorus pentoxide, so the stereotypical drying agent that we're used to seeing in most organic and inorganic chemistry labs, if you milled one molar equivalent of P4O10 and 10 molar equivalents of urea with um, cellulose nanocrystals. So again, when I'm talking molar equivalents, I'm talking in, in relation to that monomeric unit. Um, if we mill those things for 90 minutes at just under 30 hertz or 30 hertz, um, we can obtain a phosphorylated material that I can obtain simply by washing and centrifuging with DI water and then freeze drying to give us back that final product, which came out as a white powder. So obviously for a material like this, if that's our goal, if we want to find out how effective we are at doing our job, there's a couple of key questions that we ultimately have to ask. And so the first one, and maybe the most obvious one, is how much phosphate are we actually putting on that surface? Um, the second one, and this comes back to what I said at the beginning of this project, is we want to make sure that if there is phosphate present, that it's covalently bound to the surface of our cellulose nanocrystal. We don't want it floating around on its own. We want to make sure that this material is going to be stable in the long run. And so I was able to confirm this pairing up uh, magic angle spinning phosphorus NMR, as well as XPS analysis, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And also, um, it wouldn't be much of a talk about flame retardants if we didn't test their thermal stability. And so I was able to do this ultimately through TGA, and I'll, I'll talk about those uh, results as they come up. So first and foremost, with our NMR and XPS studies, so again, we're, we're talking about how much phosphate we have and is it actually down to the surface? Um, a couple of unique things came up, which was kind of cool. So um, just like you would for a normal solution-based NMR where you're running a reference and you're calibrating essentially your quantities based around that reference, we did very much the same in this case with ammonium dihydrogen phosphate as our external standard. And what's really interesting is that when we ran our samples, so this is uh, an example of one of our phosphorylated systems, you actually see a pair of peaks. So the first peak right around 0.9 ppm is exactly what we'd expect. It's, it's just like I've drawn here. It's that monophosphorylated COP bond signal that, um, that we would see in these types of systems. But uniquely, and what's actually kind of cool, is even after that centrifugation washing, um, we're seeing a secondary peak here on the side at around minus 13 ppm. And that had actually been previously noted to be the hydrolysis and ring opening product of phosphorus pentoxide. So not only are we actually getting a material which mimics that which we would see in solution, namely the monophosphorylated CNCs that we've been hunting for, but we're also getting a unique product formation, um, which is only obtainable in this case by mechanochemistry, which I think is really cool. Um, and I know that my colleagues have also previously highlighted how cool this is. So this gives you some idea. It's not just small molecules. Um, these rules also come into play with materials and nanoparticles as well. Um, and with our XPS data, the story is very much the same. So we see that any phosphate we, there, we have in our material is bound in a POC type fashion, meaning that we've washed out all of that free phosphate and we're just quite literally stuck with the phosphate that's there on the surface. We then went on to check uh, the thermal stability of these resulting materials. So um, for those of us that aren't maybe as familiar with thermal gravimetric analysis or TGA, um, in the case of flame retardants, there's kind of two key parameters that we want to look at. And the first one is uh, the mass loss. So obviously for a flame retardant, we want to lose as little mass as possible. But the second is our inflection temperature. And that's essentially where we start to see a really dramatic shift in the mass of our sample um, as we're ramping up the temperature. So as we're ramping up the temperature, the machine is naturally going to measure that change in mass. Um, and what's interesting is that whether we're manually stirring our materials together, so this has no impact or really heavy shear forces. This is just in a beaker with a stir bar stirring our solids. Um, or with a ball mill, which gave us much more consistent results overall, 
we're seeing that our mass loss um, is actually much less. So we're retaining more of that material, which is great. Um, but also interestingly, our inflection temperature is moving earlier up that curve. So we're starting to see changes now at around maybe 140, 150 degrees Celsius. And this is actually pretty typical for these types of materials. People have uh, highlighted this before and talked about it, but this early mass loss is actually a good thing. This is where we're forming that protective char layer that we're all used to seeing when you're burning wood, for example. Um, in this case, it's actually accelerated by the fact that we can actually kick out phosphoric acid thermally under a hydrolysis process, which then is gonna subsequently dehydrate our cellulose. And it's that dehydration that's giving us that sort of dark char layer on the outside, which acts as a thermal shield for the rest of the material. Naturally, we wanted to compare both the NMR method, but also just the relative behavior of our material to stuff that had been previously highlighted in literature. So um, I went back and both took the direct numbers from the paper, as well as actually replicated their procedure to confirm that um, the NMR method that we developed at McGill was actually working to validate the loadings. Um, and what we see, which is actually really cool, is that by mechanochemistry, we're able to, regardless of the P loading or system that we're using, um, with that phosphorus pentoxide and your pairing in the ball mill, we're actually getting numbers that are over twice as high as you would normally see in solution. So again, this is really cool. It's this powder in, powder out sort of idea. There's no major waste in the actual synthesis. Um, and we're also seeing that along with that super high loading, the relative mass losses and inflection temperatures are right in those ballparks that we talked about before. Um, so fundamentally, they're behaving exactly as we want them to, which is great to see. Now, it wouldn't be a flame retardant talk without videos of me setting stuff on fire. Um, so these are three samples, and I'll walk you through them as they play. Um, but these are three samples of spruce wood. So this would be the same sort of wood, the same sort of layered paneling you would see uh, in the walls of a home, for example. And I've got three major samples here. So I've got an untreated sample on the left, a sample in the middle that has 1% weight loading CNC with no functionality to it, and then one weight percent of our phosphorylated cellulose nanocrystals by milling. And what's interesting is that in the first two cases, um, something I wanna definitely point out is, first off, our ignition temperature is actually sped up. And so what we suspect that is a result of is you can imagine you're now coating that surface with lots of high surface area nanocrystals of cellulose. So you're actually speeding up that process. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind compared to our phosphorylated CNC system is the intensity of that hot spot where the torch tip is actually touching the surface. So in the case of whether it's untreated or CNC non-modified, we see that there is that definite intense hotspot. You can actually see some cracking on the surface right where that tip is touching. Um, whereas in the case of our functionalized material, that char is present across the whole surface. And we see that heat is actually being dissipated across more or less that whole block. So we suspect that's what's really helping to slow the overall ignition of the material overall by about two, um, 2.4 times compared to the untreated. Now, I got really excited at about this point in the project and I thought, well, CNC is great and all, but like, does this method work for everything else? And so I went through our cabinet of polymers and I picked out a couple that were pretty standard um, and wanted to see if we could do post modification um, of ready-made polymers of any size and could we get similar type phosphorylation data? And so. I won't bore you with the NMR, you're gonna to have to trust me on this one, but um, I can say confidently that regardless of the type of substrate we used, whether it was craft lignin, which for those of you that have ever worked with lignin before or biomass know that this is horrendously insoluble in most things, um, along with a range of synthetic polymers as well, um, we're actually able to get post-functionalization to give us those phosphorylated variants. Um, where traditionally something like a, PV, um, a PVA or a PVC to make the phosphorylated variant, you would typically make a specialized monomer and then polymerize that monomer. So it's really nice to see that we can actually work on a variety of polymers without ever needing to work in specialized conditions um, or be dependent on the weight or size of the polymer that we ultimately choose to use. So that's really cool. So overall, 
I know that's a lot to take in, but overall for the first project, I'm really happy to say that we've been able to functionalize a, a bunch of different polymers and naturally occurring cellulose nanocrystals. Um, ultimately, after we'd functionalized those materials, the thermal stability was comparable to what we'd seen in solution as well. Um, and ultimately, when we applied them as flame retardant coatings, they behaved as advertised. So um, it's great to see that fundamental scientific research actually matching up to the applied data that we see when we do these kind of tests. So that was really cool. Now, about the time when this project was really getting into full swing, I got really interested in solid state phosphorylating reagents and solid state phosphorus chemistry in general. And, and I got um, sort of sidetracked or rather maybe followed a, a new interesting path in towards nanoparticle design. And this largely had to do with, again, the influence that I saw when I was uh, working in the Morse lab. And one of the key things that we got looking into eventually was could we actually make now metal phosphide nanoparticles, specifically nickel phosphide, um, using sodium phosphide as a unique precursor. Now, sodium phosphide isn't exactly a, a reagent that you see used all that often in the synthetic literature, um, but I came across it sort of haphazardly and uh, wondered if we could use it for some really interesting chemistry. And I'm glad to say that it's worked out pretty well for us. But again, I want to give some validation as to why uh, looking into photocatalytic water splitting, why is that important? Where did we come up with this idea? So I shouldn't have to tell the audience this, but we need to step away from fossil fuels. I think most people in the room can totally agree that it's a non-sustainable, uh, non-long-term sort of challenge that we're running up against. Um, and if you look at the numbers um, <clears throat> in the last, or since the Industrial Revolution, pardon me, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere have gone from 278 parts per million to over 480. This is contributing to things like climate change. Um, and our demand for energy, along with the waste that we're producing, has also increased dramatically. So we've gone from 629 quad BTUs, or British thermal units, um, in 2017, to now a predicted 813 by 2040. So the energy demand by humanity is going up, but that also means that the CO2 that we produce is also going up. Um, so why in turn use something like hydrogen? Well, the first and probably most obvious choice is that we avoid that carbon generation problem. Um, obviously when we put hydrogen through a combustion cycle, it's just gonna produce water as a byproduct. Um, and one of the ways that we can ultimately do this is by photoactive, uh, photocatalytic water splitting, pardon me. And one of the key sort of schematic catalysts that have been used a lot in the literature recently has been pairing graphitic carbon nitride, which is um, this wonderful organic photocatalyst. It's metal free. You can make it um, on a gram or kilogram scale really easily. Um, and it works over a broad spectrum uh, light as well. We can pair this ultimately with some sort of co-catalyst. So whether that's a metal nanoparticle, a metal oxide, um, metal sulfides or phosphides as well. Um, and the co-catalyst is actually acting to take that excited electron that we generate under, in this case, photocatalytic behavior, take and hold on to that electron and give it enough of a lifetime in that high energy state where we can use it for effective catalysis. In this case, um, turning water into hydrogen gas. And so specifically, we wanted to dial in on those nanoparticles specifically. And because of my connection to phosphorus and phosphorus chemistry, we thought, well, let's look at making some metal phosphides. So metal phosphides, in terms of their reagent choice and how we make them, have had kind of a broad range of, of different reagents to choose from over the years. And these reagents typically fall into two major camps. You either have the really, really reactive camps. So these are things like um, white phosphorus, phosphorus trichloride, um, tris TMS phosphines, these sort of phosphine generator type uh, reagents. And that's all well and good, but they tend to be really reactive. Sometimes if you're not careful, um, the size control or morphology of the control of the final product can be a challenge as well. Um, and there's naturally safety concerns with reagents like this. On the other end of the spectrum, you have things that are much more stable, so improving our safety, um, but as a consequence, oftentimes need high, high energies to activate. So these are things like direct synthesis from red phosphorus, uh, 
um, or using very traditionally a reagent used in, nano, in nanophosphide synthesis is trisoctophosphine, which I'll now refer to as TOP just for ease. Um, and in both cases, you're having to break really strong stable systems. So whether that's PP bond formation in red phosphorus or these phosphorus carbon bonds that we ultimately have to break in top to give us those free, um, those free phosphines. And so I wanted to sort of split the gap um, between the two of them. And around that time, I was reading up on um, sort of activated red and white phosphorus. And the concept of sodium phosphide came across my desk. Um, and you could think of this almost as an activated form of, of red phosphorus, at least in how we make it. That's, that's how we see it. Um, and for those that are interested, I can always um, pass on literature as well. But there's been a lot of really cool literature um, relating to using metal phosphides as phosphine generators for things like uh, PC bond formation as well, which I won't go into detail here. Um, but I think Tom Barber has a really nice paper in ACS Catalysis from, I want to say, earlier last year. Anyway, I can link to that later on. But this was motivation for what we wanted to do. Could we use sodium phosphide um, mechanochemically to make metal phosphide nanoparticles? And again, to give motivation as to how this looks compared to not just the reagents, but also the methodologies we're using to make these particles, it's, it's much of the same, right? It's, it's these high temp, long reaction times in really unique solvents. So in this case, this is trick trisoctylphosphine oxide, so the, the oxide form of our phosphorus source, um, or a phosphite reduction, which is also very common. Um, phosphites, in the presence of a little bit of moisture, will actually generate phosphine gas. And so this, in turn, you can use um, as, a phosphor, or as a phosphatizing agent, pardon me, for uh, a metal salt, in this case, say nickel. But again, Regardless of the situation, we're running this at 200 degrees under nitrogen atmosphere. In this case in particular, the um, control over particle size was a bit of a challenge. So there's, there's a lot of room to grow here. And there wasn't really much in the way of bottom-up nanoparticle synthesis for metal phosphides. So I wanted to see if sodium phosphide would sort of bridge that gap for us and give us the ability to do this. So through a lot of hard work, again, I'm not gonna bore you with all the, you know, banging my head against the desk and long nights in the lab, that, that's expected. But um, Georgia really helped me on this quite a lot. So I have to give her a ton of credit on this project. But through a lot of hard work, we were actually able to optimize a synthesis where we use simply sodium phosphide, and in this case, anhydrous nickel chloride in their stoichiometric ratios. So uh, we're balancing out here to make six equivalents of sodium chloride. And we're capping off those particles in a range of long chain alkylamines. So anywhere from 14 to 17 carbons in this, in, in this bridging point here. Um, and again, this is mimicking um, a lot of the solution synthesis. We need these capping ligands to help stabilize that surface energy because when we're making particles that are two, three, four nanometers across, they naturally want to re-aggregate and form a more stable form. So we need those ligands in there to help us isolate these ultra small particles. Um, and again, coming back to the beauty of sodium phosphate as a reagent, yes, I have to still use it in a glove box. It's not perfect, um, but it is definitely easy to handle being a solid. Um, it's really, really easy to make uh, directly from sodium metal and phosphorus. So um, again, thinking from a sustainability standpoint, we're pulling from elemental precursors here. Um, and the reaction itself actually undergoes a salt metathesis. So this is something that we had seen quite a lot in the literature, um, both mechanochemically, but also in solution. So this was something we felt we could replicate fairly, um, fairly effectively. And the particles we're forming under these conditions, um, while they are aggregated, you can see that there's a lot of these really small two, three nanometer diameter particles present in, in both the broad and the zoomed in images. And so this, is, this was really promising for us, the fact that we're seeing some of the smallest nanoparticles reported in a bottom-up synthesis, again, using no solvent and no external heating. I'm, I'm running these things at room temperature for 90 minutes. Um, another thing, and I should highlight this, actually, I'll go back to this slide here just to highlight this. Um, this synthesis in particular works on the premise of both milling and aging. So by aging, I simply mean we're milling for that first 90 minutes, putting it into an activated state, 
And then we let the jars sit unperturbed for 18 hours. And what this actually gives us is it lets that high energy system, that activated system after the milling, then self-assemble into these more stabilized nanoparticles, which is ultimately our goal. So just to highlight that, it's not strictly a, a grinding and blitzing. We're actually grinding, putting into an activated state, and then letting it rest for 18 hours. And we get really nice particles out the other end. They get a really nice distribution in terms of size, um, really, really consistent overall for the number of particles that we saw. And yes, there is a little bit of oxygen present. We suspect that that oxygen is more than likely coming from um, some of the ambient workup we do. But despite the presence of the oxygen there, and I'll touch on this a little bit later when we get into the catalytic behavior, um, it's not actually hindering the behavior of the particles itself. And it's actually acting in a way as a protective passivating layer for the internal core of the particle. We were also able to do some really nice elemental mapping uh, at McGill of our aggregated systems. And so what we see again is despite that aggregation, our elements are intermixed really, really nicely. So we're not necessarily getting um, you know, islands of nickel and islands of phosphorus. We're getting a good intermixing of all three of those elements all the way through our system, which is fantastic. So again, coming back to what we think we're getting here, we're probably through milling and aging, making those nickel two phosphide cores, and then through workup under enemy conditions, we still have those perfect cores, but then we're getting a slight passivation around the outside of essentially nickel phosphates. Um, and so just for ease of conversation for the rest of my talk, whenever you see me talking about these nanoparticles, I'm gonna be talking about them um, in terms of them being nickel two phosphide, but understand that the surface ph phosphate layer a little bit of surface oxidation still present as well. So we got in touch with our friends at Université Laval and specifically Professor Trangon Do and one of his graduate students who has since graduated, so is now officially uh, Dr. Vu, but they have become specialists specifically in graphitic carbon nitride supports, as well as photocatalytic water splitting. So um, for those of you who don't know, graphitic carbon nitrides are essentially these extended carbon nitrogen networks. Um, and they can be made really easily just through annealing things like melamine together in an autoclave. But um, in the Doe lab at the Université Laval, they actually found that you could further treat this in the presence of a little bit of wet ammonia and actually make nanofragments of the same photocatalytic material. So the benefit of doing this is now we're gaining even more surface area. And again, for those of us who work in heterogeneous catalysis, we know that more surface area oftentimes is gonna to lead to higher reactivity because we've got more active sites to work with. So this was their basis for pairing now our nanoparticles with their knowledge of graphitic carbon nitride. So once again, we sent them particles, they mounted them on the surface of their material, sent them back to us, and we did more element elemental mapping of them. And again, I love these photos because you get a really, really clear picture of where all the elements are in our system. So our nickel and phosphorus, once again, are paired up really nicely. They're all localized in the same region and sort of these mini islands throughout the network. And we see, again, this bigger pad is our graphitic carbon nitride, this big purple blob. So this is fantastic. We're seeing really good mixing and really good contact between our photo support and our co-catalyst, which is the main goal of these things. We want to have really good contact in order to ensure that we get great electron transfer. We worked with them further to see how our catalyst is going to behave under photoelectrochemical um, analysis. So here we're saying, if we hit the catalyst with light, is it going to give us a current? And if we turn the lights off, is that current going to stop? Because obviously, it doesn't make much sense if we have a photocatalyst that's just going to run all the time and we don't actually have any temporal control. So what's really nice here is that we see again um, with our system, so this IM300 system where we're pairing our co-catalyst with, um, with the support, we are seeing a really nice increase in current just compared to bare car uh, carbon nitride materials. And we're seeing also great temporal control. So we do get a bit of a tailing off, but as soon as we turn that light off, the current drops off to nothing. So this is fantastic. We're seeing really good um, 
temporal control as well as increased current by pairing our systems together. And by pairing our system together, so again, looking at the red trace here instead of the black for just native graphitic carbon nitride, we're seeing a decrease in the resistivity. So what this means is overall, our catalyst by pairing the graphitic carbon nitride with nickel phosphide is actually giving electrons more readily to the system, which again, the more electrons we have, ultimately the more catalysis we can do with them. So these were both really, really great um, fundamental studies that they helped us do. But ultimately, we got to make hydrogen. With them. That's been the goal all along. And so they have a really specialized reactor at Université Laval, but very simply, all they're doing is um, a solar simulator, essentially a mini sun in a box, if you will. Um, they're irradiating through a, a quartz window into a beaker that contains our catalyst suspended in water. And then they're cooling that beaker down because obviously we don't want to have any thermal effects influencing the types of results we're getting. And as we get gas generated as time goes on, we can actually collect that gas, run it off to a gas chromatograph, and then tell us exactly how much hydrogen we're generating per hour. And so that's what we're able to see. We're, we're seeing here that despite, um, or despite cycling it, that our catalyst is not deactivated in any way. So this is great from a heterogeneous catalyst standpoint. Um, and that at our peak, we're producing 233.9 micromoles of hydrogen gas per gram of catalyst per hour. Um, so overall, it's recyclable and it's getting pretty decent numbers of hydrogen generated in the system that we've been able to develop. Now, once again, we wanted to see how we compared to everybody else. And so I pulled together some of the data from some of the state-of-the-art nickel phosphide work. Um, and again, we're not necessarily state-of-the-art. We're getting there. That's something to definitely improve on. Um, but despite this, when we looked at different phases of nickel phosphide, did the crystal phase of those particles have an influence on the final reactivity? Um, the fact that we can do this with no solvent, no high temp, it's done in a day. Um, the fact that we're getting hydrogen production values that are comparable to what we're seeing in literature is fantastic. So we've been able to forego the need for bulk solvent, the need for complicated synthesis. This is something that um, I taught Georgia to, to do, and she has taken on wonderfully well. She's fantastic at it now. Um, so teaching undergrads and early uh, stage grad students is really easy on these techniques as well. So this is something that I always try to stress is that our goal here should be to make chemistry more accessible and easier because that's something that ultimately industry is going to be more interested in. Um, and part of this project that helps lean into that, which I'm actually really proud of, is we actually put metrics to the synthesis that we did. So now we're looking at more than me just telling you, oh, it's great. We've taken out the solvent. We're doing this at room temp. Isn't that nice? Now I actually have numbers to show you that it is actually true. And so um, the values that I'm using here are mass intensity. So that's just the metric of what's the ratio of the total mass we put in our system at the beginning. So this is solvent, this is reagents, reactants, and catalysts um, as essentially a ratio to the mass of our product. So ideally, we want to get this as close to one as possible. We want this number to be as low as it possibly can, because again, we want more product for the amount of mass we're starting with. Um, and the second value I'm looking at is energy input. So this is simply done by measuring the, um, the draw from the outlet in the wall. So this is telling us how much electricity in kilowatt hours per gram are each of these methods taking. And so when I looked at thermal decomposition of a phosphite, thermal decomposition of trisalkylphosphine, and our work at a small scale, at a one gram scale, which is what these three uh, rows are, we're seeing that before washing, so before any centrifugation, obviously we're beating out the solution synthesis because it's just one to one. Um, but even after washing, we are comparable to the phosphite. And in energy alone, we're definitely way, way lower than any sort of hot plate um, or heating mantle that you would traditionally use for these types of synthesis. But this really jumps up when we actually do this on a gram scale. So um, comparing both the hot injection um, of uh, phosphite, which is kind of the standard for these types of synthesis, 
as well as being able to then mimic the same synthesis we developed for a vibrational mill, uh, this time in a, a planetary at a 2.5 gram scale. Now we're seeing real, real changes in the difference between our scaling. So again, mass intensity before washing, nothing to really shake a stick at there, it's, it's one. Um, but even the mass intensity after washing, we're now 3.3 times lower. And our energy input, look at that, we're 18.7 times lower than a gram scale synthesis of the same nanomaterial. Um, so this just goes to show that not only can we say verbally that, yeah, mechanochemistry is great, we're totally gonna save the planet by doing more of it, but now we're hoping that more scientists can actually start to put these, these words into numbers and use metrics to back up their claims. At least that's what we're hoping they'll do. So again, just to wrap up this project um, by and large, I'm really happy to say that we were able to make nickel phosphide nanoparticles, strictly speaking, from a bottom-up process with no solvent and no external heating. Uh, that ultimately speaking, despite a little bit of surface passivation, we saw no real detriment to our catalysis. They're generating great hydrogen numbers. They are recyclable, which is fantastic. Um, and also that the size is actually some of the smallest that we've seen for a bottom-up synthesis, even in solution. So, this is something that we're kind of actively looking into, why are nanoparticles made mechanochemically so much smaller and more consistent than we're seeing in solution? I'll have to get back to you on that one, or maybe Thomas Lab will beat me to the punch. Um, but this is something that we find really cool, the fact that we're able to make these really, really ultra small sub five nanometer particles um, without the need for solvent, which would traditionally act as a way to dilute the system and give us that kind of control. So this is really cool in that regard. So coming back full circle to um, the, the diagram that I showed at the beginning, I, I just wanted to wrap up and hope to present to everybody here that starting now to expand that toolbox out a little bit further, um, whether it's with phosphorus pentoxide in the P5 oxidation state down here at the bottom, um, or sodium phosphide, in this case, in a, a three minus oxidation state, if you want to think of it that way. Um, I think that it's really cool to see that these new reagents are not only being, um, are not only becoming their own, sort of on their own accord, but it really was mechanochemistry that brought me to using these reagents. So I think it, it, it does go to show that these unique methods as kind of fringe and, and confusing they may be at the beginning, they really are powerful tools to expand the synthetic toolbox that we have. Um, and again, I've been able to do a real wide range of projects, which I think speaks both to Audrey and Thomas Lott's character in letting me sort of, I don't want to say run amok, but you know, follow these crazy ideas for the last five years. Um, and the fact that we've been able to do everything from flame retardants and polymer chemistry to um, simplified synthesis of catalysts for water splitting, I think is just, it's so cool. Um, and I'm, I want to conclude on this. I want to thank you guys so much for listening in. And obviously I'm more than happy to answer any questions, uh, be it here in the chat or afterwards, but thank you guys so much. It's been a real pleasure to, uh, to speak to you all. Mm. Yeah, we uh, I checked and they they seemingly do not. So I think to a degree, and I didn't really touch on this in the in the talk itself, but I believe the milling under the conditions we were doing, and I have XRD data in the, the paper if you're interested, um, but we are losing the crystallinity of those particles as we mill them. So we we gain some benefit in the fact that we gain more surface area to functionalize, but we lose that colesteric as a result because we lose the crystallinity of our material. Okay. All right, real quick, chat, can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Sorry about that, Blaine. Uh, apparently, I, I've been talking this whole time and nobody can hear me. <laughs> no worries. I, I hope that's not true for me as well, but I guess we'll find out. No, yeah, you're, you're good. They can, they can hear you no problem. Uh, apparently, I, I think the setting got changed. Hmm. All right. Um, so...
the next question here is uh, how would one dephosphorylate uh, cellulose? Dephosphorylate. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure actually. I like I could think of potentially liberating it with another strong acid. Um, but that's a really good question. I've actually never never thought about that despite um, going through this project for so long. I'd, I'd have to get back to the person asking that question. I'm not really sure, to be honest. All right, that's fair. Um, let's see. Uh, so Isaiah naturally has to, wanted to ask some hard questions. Um, of so he wanted to know, would uh, multi-phosphorylation, like using diphosphate or triphosphates, um, increase the flame retardant activity or just cause mm -hmm. more problems? That's a good question. And from what I've seen, um, more phosphorus is always better. And I'm not just saying that as a phosphorus chemist and, and biased. But uh, diphosphates and, and triphosphates would definitely increase um, the protective nature simply for the fact that, again, you're liberating more free phosphoric acid as those di and triphosphates ultimately hydrolyze. Um, so more in this case is better, for sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I, I, W want to know what type of jars and balls do you use? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So, um, in this case, we had started the cellulose nanocrystal project with Teflon because of course, um, phosphorus pentoxide is a pretty strong oxidant. So mm -hmm. that rules out the traditionally stainless steel, but we ran into issues where Teflon was actually <laughs> leaching into our material. That's and interesting. So we switched, and so we switched over from Teflon to zirconia. So we're using zirconia both for balls and uh, and jars as well. Uh, okay. And same goes for the sodium phosphide. But based on essentially the uh, lessons we learned on cellulose, we we stuck to zirconia ever since. Uh, okay. All right. That's a, yeah. I guess I'm surprised that the Teflon. I mean, I guess I guess it does tend to leach out, but that's that's interesting that it um it it made enough of a difference. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's just the abrasive nature of, of grinding crystalline biomass with a strong oxidant, which in turn turned into a strong acid. Like, mm -hmm. it's probably a mixture of factor of factors. But uh, yeah, we were just as surprised to see to see fluorine contamination in some of our XPS, which is actually how I found out. That's a good way to tell. Yeah. Um. Okay, uh, so could do you, this is this is a question I had. Do you think that this type of mechanochemical synthesis, um, the the the, the phosphide incorporate or phosphorus incorporation, um, do you think it could be expanded to incorporation of sulfur and nitrogen from species like urea or thiourea? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I would have to dig into the literature a little bit more in terms of how effective. Um, I know thiourea's have been previously used as sulfur uh, as sulfur sources. Um, okay. We've tried a little bit with urea, not in relating to metal nitrides, but um, with some other chemistry. And urea is a little bit trickier to activate under these conditions. So okay. potentially, but we just haven't found the conditions to make that work. But uh, I know thiourea's definitely can be used for this type of chemistry for sure. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, and so this one you you, uh, you you answered, it may be in full, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyway. Sure. Um, so I, I was wondering about the aging process. So you said it, it's it's basically to let the high energy system relax almost. So if, if you pulled the sample out, let's say, you know, within five minutes of it completing, how would that affect the, the nanoparticle synthesis? Yeah, so it, that's, it's a really good point. And this was actually something that... Uh, that a couple of reviewers had asked us on the paper as well when we submitted it. But um, I did actually do, so in the, in the main synthesis we developed, we aged for 18 hours. But I, I shortened the aging time to as low as one hour. I didn't mm -hmm. do anything sub one hour just because it made it tough to age for an hour and then subsequently run up to the uh, building that had the XPS in it to test for our samples. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing nanoparticle formation even after one hour of aging. So these processes are much, much faster than we think they are, or at least initially thought they were. Um, but yes, absolutely. To come back to the beginning of the question, mm 
you can think of the milling processes where we're causing dislocations in a lot of these crystalline materials, especially in the case of sodium phosphide, for example. Mm -hmm. We're liberating them, we're forming defects, we're making these active sites. Um, metal and phosphorus reagents are now coming together. So you've got this kind of high energy, chaotic mixed state now. And we necessarily want the system to now form these very organized, very monodispersed nanoparticles, which is what the aging process is allowing us to do. It's actually letting it come down from that high energy state and form a more kinetically stable product. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chemist Craig wanted to uh, wanted to ask about on slide twenty four. Um, what was the role of the the amine? Oh right. So in in that case, let me go back just quickly to help facilitate answering. Um, but those amines, uh, and even in the traditional solution synthesis as well. But these amines um, are basically acting as capping agents. So they're coating the surface of the nanoparticles as we make them. And that helps to alleviate some of the high energy, the high surface energy, pardon me, um, that you'll get in these nanoparticle synthesis, especially at like the sub five nanometer range. So what those ligands are ultimately doing is they're preventing the really small nanoparticles from clumping together and making really big nanoparticles. So they're essentially giving us the size control that we want. Okay, so so if you... If you use, say, like a, a smaller ligand or a, a shorter yep. uh, a shorter ligand, you could basically yep. Yep. play around with the size of the particles. If for some reason, let's say you wanted a bigger particle, um, yeah, absolutely. And okay. I, that's that's a great point. I, I brushed through that um, on the initial pass, but we found too that depending on the number of carbons in that chain, mm -hmm. you have some control over the size of the particle that you see at the other end. Um, I also and I, I highlighted in, in the paper, but we tried um, using phosphines as well. So we tried um, trisoctylphosphine as our capping ligand. And we see that even depending on the um, coordinating strength of that end group, so whether we're talking a primary amine or a, um, a phosphine, for example, a tertiary phosphine, mm -hmm. um, we also see a change in the size and morphology that we're getting just based on that coordinating strength of the surface. But yes. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of play here in terms of the type of ligands we can use, okay. and ultimately the the sizes and shapes that we get. Absolutely, yeah. Interesting. All right. Um, so Ijod also wanted to ask about um, in in the imaging that you did. Um, mm -hmm. The he wanted basically how fragile um, were the nanoparticles, or, or I guess in terms of in terms of withstanding the voltage that you that you have to use to do TEM imaging, um, right. were, were they were they sensitive to that at all, or, or were they pretty stable? I am assuming they're asking about the cellulose. I'll, I'll, I'll answer in that case, because I, I know from previous literature that you can burn cellulose on electron microscopes pretty easily. Um, we didn't run into any problems, but Professor Moores has actually developed a lot of methodology over the years um, just for imaging cellulose nanocrystals. So we we dipped into our old toolbox and um, and it's been published. So if you're interested, I can get you those papers as well. Um, but we didn't run into any issues with uh, with particles burning on the microscope. Thank goodness. That, that makes imaging them a lot easier. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so Isaiah also want to know if there's any difference in nanoparticle size and shape when you use the different milling styles. So I know at the end you talked about the, yeah. the planetary versus... Um, the shaker. So did, did that give you different products or are they pretty much the same? They're pretty much the same as far as we can tell. So that's okay. really interesting to me as well. And that's something that I've, I haven't gone back and looked at in great detail. And it's probably something that I may have to give up the go on in the last couple of months before I graduate. But it's interesting that whether we used um, one 10 millimeter ball, which is more of an impact based or did it in a planetary, which has a lot more shear force, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. um, the particle morphology we got was more or less the same. And I, I think just to come back to an earlier point, I think this really speaks to the importance of aging in this synthesis. That it's, it's not just about that initial blitz to get our, our mixed um, sort of powder matrix, if you will. Okay. It is actually the aging afterwards where we let the jars sit and self-assemble that's controlling the, the size and shape of the particles that we're seeing. Okay. Um, 
So I guess just real quick, if if you use something like let's say you changed out the the amine for, uh, I'm trying to think of some other things that people have used like uh, a, a larger, like a, a bulkier, um, but non-linear uh, ligand, so like uh, tetraloctyl ammonium bromide or something like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, would that? Do you think that that you could start to play around with stuff like the morphology or like the size and shape of the of the particles? Potentially, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe cop out here a little bit and say it depends. Um, sure. So the Morris lab, well, actually, both um, both Audrey and Thomas lab published a paper, I believe, in 2014, and I can I can link to it after the talk, um, where we did gold we did a gold nanoparticle synthesis in much the same way. There was no aging in this particular synthesis, but again by by milling. Okay. And in that paper, they did test things like. Um, bipyridine ligands and kind of your more traditional chelating ligands that, mm -hmm. that weren't these sort of stereotypical linear ones. Um, and in that paper, at least for gold, um, they noted that with those types of ligands, you get a lot of irregular sized particles and very almost like bulk material at that stage. Mm -hmm. So that, again, is strictly speaking the case for gold. But um, it might be interesting to try. That's something we never tried with the, the metal phosphide stuff. Okay, but um, but could potentially be interesting for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. Um, so, do you think you can you get um, like you, you showed uh, towards the end of this part? You had the the different phases that people you know that you were sort of comparing your work to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you know of a way to get to get those different nickel phosphide phases from this method, or or have yeah. you pretty much always ended up with the nickel two phosphide? Yeah, we we tried really hard. I uh, George and I tried this for probably the better part of two or three months. We we called it our we called it our phase hunting phase. Um, and regardless of the stoichiometries we picked um, or the ligands we tried, seemingly all the samples we made were nickel two phosphide. And okay. nickel two phosphide is the more th the more thermodynamically stable phase. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't know if that has some interplay in saying, you know, regardless of the stoichiometry we start with, this is always the product we're going to get. Okay. Um, but at least with this system under these synthetic conditions, uh, I was unfortunately not able to get any other phases. I wish I could say otherwise, but uh, not in this case. Okay. Um, so let's see. We have uh, Dr. Kothapali also wanted to know um, if branched polyamines would also have the same effect yeah yeah that's a great point um quite possibly and the only reason i say this is when we when we went from taking our nickel phosphide and then ultimately grafting it onto our graphitic carbon nitride um dr vu at université laval ultimately had to actually change out the ligands for um, tetraethyl ammonium, so these branched, essentially branched ammonium ligands. But we never looked at that in great detail, but that's a good point. Um, again, there's a lot of really unique amine and phosphine ligands out there, and it mm -hmm. would be something cool to see if there was more of a screening done, what kind of effect that would have on particles. But yeah, sadly, that's something we never looked at in great detail. Okay. Um... Okay, so with the the hydrogen evolution that you showed, um, mm -hmm. was that from pure uh, pure water, like de just pure deionized water, no no uh, sacrificial reagents or anything like that? So I I, I left that part out. There is um there is a sacrificial reagent for whole scavenging uh, tetraethyl. Um, oh, it, the name escapes me. This is awful. No, um, that's, that's okay. But, what, but you, you had the whole scavenger in there to sort of, yes, to basically yes, kind of see like the best that it can do, that kind of thing. Yeah. So we're not quite in. Yeah. So I should clarify, we're not quite in uh, overall water splitting territory. Mm -hmm. I would love to get there, um, but right now we need that whole scavenger at least for this system. So yeah, in, in yeah. all the samples that I show, mm -hmm. uh, we are using that whole scavenger for sure. Okay. Yeah. There's, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. I, I've done some water splitting myself and. Sometimes, sometimes you want to see sort of what what your system can do. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah exactly. You know, I've used whole and electron scavengers. Nothing wrong with that. So, um, okay. And our, our last question here, uh, unless somebody, you know, if, if anybody has any final questions, make sure to get them in, um, or, or not final questions, but any additional questions, go ahead and get them in now. 
Um, to uh, Pizza Sepulchrate uh, wanted to know if you run any type of computational calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't personally, uh, but we've been sort of working off and on with some collaborators on this as well. But I'm I'm not going to say any more than that. I would okay. love to get into computational chemistry a little bit more. It is something that um, definitely piques my interest. But okay. uh, I might have to I might have to save a lot of that learning for my postdoc. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, all right, so I think if there, if anybody has any final questions, get them in. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think I'll go ahead and start the wrap up. If, if any additional questions come in, I'll let you know. Um, so I, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, obviously, I would like to thank Blaine as well. Uh, this was a fantastic talk. Uh, again, it's always really cool to see the things that can be done. Um, uh, with with mechanochemistry, I am learning more and more, and, and I may need to get in touch with Tomislav. <laughs> I got some, man, I got some ideas, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, this was really cool. So uh, you know, this is really interesting work, and uh, you know, uh, this just, it's, it's just fascinating. So uh, you know, congratulations on a great talk. And, Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it, I I really feel. Uh, Quite privileged to do this, but it's been uh, it's been quite the ride for the last four years, and I'm excited to see where where this chemistry leads for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that's everything, um, and so uh, I guess I'll say one more thank you to the audience. Uh, appreciate you guys coming out. Um, and uh, let's see, next week we have uh, Dr. Amy Peterson from uh, UMass Lowell, who will be doing talk to, talking about plastics engineering. So we're careening in yet another direction for next week. Um, but in the meantime, thank you once again to Blaine, um, and especially as you are uh, in, your, in your last year of grad school. Uh, look forward to seeing what happens there. And um, thank you uh, for a fantastic talk. And uh, I hope everybody will come out next week. Um, it'll be same time, same day. And uh, yeah. I think that'll be it for tonight. Um, Blaine, if, if I can get you to stick around for just one second, we'll talk just yeah, a little bit course. more. And uh, for everybody else, uh, have a great weekend. Uh, please stay safe and, and wear a mask. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll see you all then. Have a great weekend.